This is Eating Crow with Pete Durand. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Eating Crow. I have Jamal Marshall on the program today. We met a year ago, was it? About? About. Yeah, I had to go through his people to get to get an appointment. It was tough. Silly, man. <laughs> it was tough. I had to get on his calendar. By the way, he's more famous than I am on LinkedIn, which is kind of cool. So this is an honor for me. When we met, I got off the phone and said, that is one of the most genuine people I've ever met. 100%. And I think our parting wishes, I, I think the last thing I said to you was, you're going to do some really cool stuff. I had no idea what it was, but here you are. Here I am, bro. Let's go. Let's get into it. I have a, I'm going to go places other people haven't gone. I'm going to start out with, tell me about your time in prison. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. He's going through the resume. Oh, I just, it's so I was like, what, what, that's a good line. Tell me about your time in prison. You know, when I read through that, it started to help me understand why you do what you do. When you see people, both the people who are incarcerated and their families in one of the most difficult situations there could be, and you're there to try to help them get through it or understand it or talk about it, which has obviously led you on the journey that you're on. What was that like for you? It was six years, right? Six years of your life you were doing that? Well, six years at the Federal Bureau of Prisons, the Department of Justice, and then going in. My dream was to be a DTS. I wanted to be a drug treatment specialist. And I had really? this wacky thing. You don't, you obviously don't see it on LinkedIn because it wouldn't make any sense in right. my experience section. I wanted to get people off psychotropic meds without the traditional psychological you know, way that it's done, of, which sounds crazy. You have to wean from off of those things. It's sure. So people in the system that are on drugs. But I got a chance, actually, once I left DOJ and moved to Middle America when I was in Indiana, where I was going in weekly to some jails there and, and prisons there. And it is when the door is locked behind you and you're in there, you kind of can get that anxiety. Of, okay, I mean, I'm in here. But I want people to know who are listening, who've never been inside of a prison. It's like a little city, pretty much indoors. And we would hold classes with the inmates and uh, it would usually be two of us. I found myself comfortable sitting with them and instead of like having the separate whiteboard mm -hmm. partition of you just sit with these guys. And that these are some of the most brilliant minds inside these four walls and people who are just like you and I, who are just maybe one decision, yeah. one encounter, one click away. Each of us is, if we think about it, if we're gut level honest from being in that position, they just happen to get caught or they just happen to make decisions that piled up that landed them where they are, but they are people just like any other person. And so interacting with them was quite amazing. And even teaching some of the classes, like you learn from a public speaking standpoint, you're going to get some hecklers. You're going to get some, some guys that are kind of rowdy. And I mean, I, I lived in Southeast DC for most of my life. I like them kind of rowdy, <laughs> but I just learned to look at them as people because they are people just like we are, you know what I mean? It's like extreme stand-up. It's like the X Games of stand-up when you're, when you're oh public goodness. speaking in a prison. Yes, <laughs> because they, they especially depend on the time that they're there or, or if they're on good time or if they're getting out. They don't care. <laughs> they don't care, but they're actually just filling you out to see like, this guy is new here. Let me, what can I get away with? Is mm -hmm. he going to be somebody that's not going to put up with it? Is he going to ignore me? It, it just depends on, on who you get. And you just can't, you got to have fun with it. You can't get ruffled by it at all i'm looking at this pie chart in my head of what makes you tick and what what would get someone to do that and i'm asking you to correct me the biggest slice of pie has to be just a huge piece of empathy right empathy has to be a huge part of how you're wired but then you said something earlier when we just got on the call about you really wanted to help people get off of these these drugs and it's such a difficult process so there has to be in addition to empathy, there's a problem solving analytical part of you that says, I can do this. So when you first walked into a prison, what was it about it that when you walked out, you said, I'm going to go back? I think interacting with them and also interacting with the staff. Okay. I was always there with them like day to day, mm -hmm. um, especially like the chaplain, because they're there and they know different things about them. They've confided things in them. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, or even if some of them come in and they, you know, maybe a fight breaks out or whatever like that, there's a reason behind that. 
And so what made me want to come back was just like, I could very easily in the wrong situation be one of these people. Would I want someone to come back and come to, to talk with me and to mentor with me, to teach me, to counsel me? And also that was one way of engendering trust. Like if you just came in one time and they didn't see your face again, or maybe didn't see you till three or four months later, it's just like, oh, this, this person's trying to check a box. Sure. Just being consistent, you know? And so no, and not so much I had to, but if I was on the receiving end, what would I want someone to do if I was in that position? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Now, when you talk about you could have been one decision away, any one of us could be, were you actually ever close to kind of making a decision that would send you in the wrong direction as you grew up? You know, how close were you? Oh, my peeps didn't play that. So <laughs> not so much. Um, but when you look at casework studies and you see some of the things like, let's just say I have to keep everything confidential, but there was a guy who I would pen pal with and he ended up behind bars because he was involved with a girl who was underage, but she actually was faking her age. And sure. he wasn't trying to blame her for it, but she was saying that, okay, I'm 19 or 20, whatever, like yeah. that, but it was 16, you know, and he did not know that. And so based on, even with the fake ID, that whole advent that happened in the nineties and everything like that, there was a lot, there's a lot of people behind bars to this day because of that. And so you think like that could be you or I. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this part of your life, I want to talk about what you're doing today. But I think this is important because, as you mentioned, there are a lot of people who may check a box, right? I'm going to do a mission trip. I'm going to go visit someone in a prison. I'm going to go see someone in old folks and think I did some good, right? Make myself feel good. There are very few people who do it for an extended period of time because they feel like they have a calling and they should be there doing. People don't go into this for the money. That's right? it. This is a calling. You were a year ago you had this passion and you had this ability to connect with people and listen, right? Then speak, which is the name of your podcast, which is fantastic, by the way, says says the podcaster who's talking nonstop for the last three minutes. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm curious, in the last year, how did you hone in on what your purpose was? I think it was always there before the last year and you know my story from when we first connected a mm-hmm. long time ago mm-hmm. you know after my dad passed a lot of those aspects of listening speaking uh one-on-one peer outreach mentoring counseling i let that stuff lay dormant and just kind of die in me because i, I felt like it died with him mm-hmm. and I, I can't speak to everyone who's who's your audience but grief is different for different people and for him when he passed grief for me was very cruel and knock the wind out of me. I would say coming on the other side of it, quote unquote, because it still is a journey. Mm-hmm. Um, it's helped me to, to deal with people with a measure of grace. And if I'm dealing with a client or potential client, no matter what they tell me, I never pretend that I'm shocked because <clears throat> whatever thing they're facing, I can go there, I've been there mm-hmm. uh, or have the potential to go there. And so part of finding that calling uh, was just seeing that, especially on a platform like LinkedIn, you have to kind of put your best foot forward, or at least it's it was at least initially designed that way. Very B2B, very peer-to-peer, very, this is the shiny picket fence that I present myself with. Sure. And I would notice when I was creating content, which kind of took me by surprise because I wasn't intending to, it would grab an audience of, okay, that's exactly what I was thinking. And you said it, or you verbalized it. And then when I wrote something on your post, you responded to me in a way that shows me you're honoring what I'm writing to you. Mm-hmm. You know, Because you can have somebody write write to you and really resonate with your stuff. But if you put praying hands under that, you're not honoring the time they spent to actually come interact with your content. Right. It let me know those things are still there. And dad's passing wasn't to knock the wind out of me. It was actually to give me a second one to say, man, you're, you're still in the race. Keep running that race and take as many with you as possible. So I just noticed there was a large group and contingent of people, professionals that potential wise had crazy potential. We're just kind of waiting for that perfect circumstance. So ideally, my ideal client is me, you know, that person who's just perfect procrastinator. It's not going to be perfect. Just do it. Everyone's not going to like you. Just do it. You won't have the perfect sound or perfect look. Just do it. And I'm here to walk with you. Hills and valleys. Well, you know, you just very graciously defined your eating crow moment, right? Your father passes. And there's a couple of things I want to drill down into there. 
there are unfortunately fewer and fewer people that feel that way about their father. Hmm. Right. You're blessed. I feel the same way about my dad. He's in his seventies and he's, and I can say this honestly, and I've said this in another podcast, he's one of the greatest men I've ever met in my entire life. And I mean that as a man, he's not a, a big burly, take the room over. He's very quiet. I've never seen him do the wrong thing ever. And at great sacrifice at times, and I've never heard anyone speak ill of my father ever. And that's not because he couldn't hold the line. So what I'm curious is, when you think about your dad and the deep relationship you had with him, what are the characteristics that your dad had that, that you feel resonate the most with you and have had the biggest impact on you? That's a great question, Pete. And it's a bit the opposite for the, the larger or period of his life. Okay. He did a lot of wrong things. Did he? You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, his background, he had a background of abuse and drugs and alcohol since mm. he was 11. <sighs> Never heard the words, I love you, from both his mom or his dad. So mm. his, this is someone who had to teach himself everything. He learned how to read by sitting in a park reading newspapers. Didn't graduate high school. So he's somebody who kind of literally defined pulling himself up by his own bootstraps. Wow. I know we hear that term, but seeing him live it out. And because uh, even growing up, having to raise like nine other younger brothers and sisters, he didn't want kids. And so coming up as a little boy, we weren't, you know, like everyone today, everybody sees that they know that I know my dad is my best friend. That wasn't the case growing up. Often grew up very disconnected from him. And it wasn't until I would say about 2006. I mean, and I know your audience is probably like my audience pretty broad. There are those who have a faith. There are those who may not. Right. Um, but he found, you know, faith in Christ and it changed his life. And it was weird. Like I, I saw someone who I would deem mean enough to be Satan himself. His whole life completely changed. And so one who I would deem my worst enemy became my best friend. So for years until I was like 22, I had this person who I, who I lived with, who I in some ways hated, that I came to love. And I had so much inside of me that I couldn't wait to get out so much. I couldn't wait to point the finger at him. And when I came to him with all of that, he absorbed it and he owned it. And uh, we built for 11 years what we never had when I was little. So. That's why I cherish my dad, because I got to build with him wasn't but wasn't there before. It wasn't like I grew up yeah. with, the, you know, white picket fence. I did not. But I had something that wasn't there before. And then he was somebody who I could always talk to about everything. He was a great listener. That may be where I get that from. I'm not sure. Uh -huh. <laughs> Very great listener. And he processed before he spoke. He didn't speak too many words but when he did they landed really well and he could relate to anybody and no matter what your age what your race ethnicity background religion he could just relate people were so drawn to him so and he knew when i was all worked up he knew how to talk his boy off just off a ledge <laughs> something about i just i wish he was still here because i have a lot of things on my mind these days but do you have uh brothers or sisters yeah three older sisters man <laughs> oh my goodness were yeah, they cool. able to come to the same relationship with your father that you did? One of them, the one right over me. I'm not sure about the other two. Because we're all, you know, every sibling, no matter what, every child has a different relationship with. Absolutely. Them. Absolutely. Um, and I'm glad for, for me, especially being his youngest and his only boy, that I got there because I needed that. You know, your dad uh, probably ate 30 years of crow in the last 11 years. And the fact that you went to him with all that baggage and he owned it, he gave you great life lessons right there. And not many people will a seek forgiveness, right? That's a very difficult thing to do is to ask forgiveness for, and be genuine about it. And it's even more difficult to give it as you did. We touched a little bit on this. We didn't go this deep the last time you and I talked, but I knew there had to be something more there. Right. And when he discovered his faith and you were able to build an 11 year relationship with him, if you were sitting with your dad today and you could ask your dad one question, what would it be? Man. <laughs> so I can't think of just one. That's a tough question to ask me because I want to ask him so much. Man. 
I'd ask him, can you come back and stay for a little while? Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? That's what I would ask him. I just, I just want to hold him, man. I had a dream about him the other day. Did you? So, yeah, I see him. I still see him in my dreams. When did he pass, Jamal? How, how long ago was it? Uh, December 5th, 2017. Yeah, so it's still pretty fresh. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, when you think about the impact your dad had on you and the fact that he had so many brothers and sisters and didn't anticipate being a father, how does that make you feel about becoming a father? I'll be honest with you. As you know, I don't answer questions partly. I like to answer them in the whole. There's Absolutely. fear there because it's like, yeah. I wonder, is there a cycle? You know, is that something in the back of my head? Like, I can't tell you how many times that I've heard you make such a great father. And it's a part of me that wants it, but it's a part of me that like dreads it. Like, how can I give what, you know, maybe I didn't receive for the whole of my life and only part, mm -hmm. but I don't think anyone goes into fatherhood or, or let alone even marriage or any journey of our life knowing everything. And I know there's career people that listen to your podcast. You don't go into a job knowing how to do your job. I don't care what your resume says or what your interview said. You go in there just fresh saying, I'm going to just figure this thing out. And so all I can do, to be honest with you, Pete, is just figure it out as I go. And even, even the failures of, okay, this is what mom and dad, even my mom's absolutely divine. This is what they did wrong. And this is what I will never do. Some of those things will still happen. Sure. <laughs> it's just sure. part of the journey. And so for me, uh, in answering your question, I anticipate fear, but also anticipate just, just great faith and trying to learn as I go and, and raising those little ones to, to, to be the best they can be and just supporting them and grooming them into what they want to be. Because I, I will say this, even with even before things came around with, with my, my dad and I, he never positioned me to try to live his life through me vicariously. There was a plan because I got a 93 on the ASVAB to, you know, for me to go in the military. I mean, recruiters would come and see me left and right. Mm -hmm. Of course, this was 2001 and this was right on the heels of 9-11. So, of course, that did influence my decision to say, eh, I don't know. Right. And they could have, I mean, I was still very impressionable from a parental standpoint, being a 17 year old. So they could have easily said, no, you, you just need to do this. And I would have done it, but they didn't exploit that in me. And did I your really dad serve? He didn't. Like my grandfather and all of his brothers did. Mm -hmm. And one of my uncles served, he just, just retired. So a lot of military presence in my family and my sister right over me, she went into the military. So it's just, you know. It was around uh, you. It was around me. And I, I did the young Marines. I, I even went to NCO school. So I could have gone into the Marines as a PFC. I was good and I excelled at it, but it's not what I wanted to do. Sure. And so I was really thankful that even with all of those things, they honored, okay, what do you want to do? I actually wanted to go to school. So I went to school. And the only reason I would have gone to the military was to pay it off. But I found some hacks of like going to school without taking out any loans. And so I owe Regent University and any other school nothing but to love them. So <laughs> no student loans here, baby. Hey, good for you. Well, you know, we're, we're going to shift topics here in a second, but I want to close this with as a father and as a son, I've been in both those camps. You know, I think the gift your dad gave you by really becoming close with you for the last 11 years shows you that any cycle can be broken. The fact that he was able to pick himself up off the ground and do that on his own, that says it all. Every one of us has the ability to wake up in the morning and make a choice to do something different than we've done in the past. Every one of us has that ability. The other thing you said that's very wise, you, you've always struck me as wise beyond your younger than me years, I'll just say that, <laughs> is when people, and Matt Wells, who you, you know Matt, and, and I think the world of Matt and, and his podium and his platform that he's chosen to be very vocal as a, as a father is just tremendous, right? He and I were talking the other day and he's very well read. He, he studies up on how to be a better father and learn. And we talked about the fact that it's always good to learn and draw things. And you made an interesting point. He draws things differently for each one of his kids. Maybe the same point has to be applied differently. There is no playbook. You know, when my daughter, who was my firstborn, came home, yeah, we were, I looked at my wife and like, yep, we got to figure this out. <laughs> and every day after, you just figure it out. Whether you ever become a father or not, ever want to do that, because that, again, that's who knows what everybody's path is, right? You're going to influence people's lives as a father, as a mentor, as a friend, as a peer, regardless of what it is. You know, the fear should be only because it's unknown. 
you should never have fear of failure, Jamal, because you will not fail at that task. Trust me. Appreciate that encouragement, brother. Not at all. Let's shift a bit because we've touched a little bit about what got you here. You know, the fact that you had to pick yourself up after your dad died and, and do a little, and you put it right in your about section, your LinkedIn, right? You said, this is, this is the path I was on. I had to figure out where I wanted to go. So I would love you to explain to the people listening what it is you do and why you enjoy it so much. All right. From what angle? I'm a podcaster as well. So what, what, which part? <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to try answer your question. We'll touch on international justice mission in a minute because that's your day job. Um, it's like Clark Kent, you know, you go to the Daily Bugle, you do your thing. and But if I'm seeing you for the first time on LinkedIn, or I've seen your podcast for the first time, what's my takeaway? If I'm going to reach out to you, because you actually invite people to DM you, and then you can help them. When you say help them, I have two questions for you. What do you, what do, you do? And my guess is it's different for almost everybody. And then do people pay you for this service? Yes. How do, how do, yeah. So that's, it's a business. Right. You can do you people can do businesses to help each other all the time. So help us understand what it is you do for people and then maybe kind of what the business model is. You got it. So if anyone's interacting with my content, I don't end every post with a CTA. I, I think sometimes you gotta let people breathe from that. Yeah. There's some content creators I follow that I think do a really good job at balancing the CTA with also just getting to know who they are so you can engender some trust. And most of since I've started my journey of creating content, most of the leads have been inbound. Um, because when you start to push more for outbound leads, be ready, especially if you're a full-time worker, <laughs> to handle that. Um, yeah. But what I offer is a six to 12 week program, uh, coaching through the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I tailor make it to the person. I do a 30 minute consultation to figure out who are they? What are their pain points? And how do we address those pain points? And I'll also use other materials around that. It's normally through that book but I use materials that address who they are. Like if they have an issue with procrastination, we're going to do materials on procrastination. Okay. If their issue is fear, we're going to do that on fear. If it's bitterness, unforgiveness, we're going to tackle those things. I'm not a big fan, and I'm not saying these don't work. I'm not a huge fan of the online courses because it's statistically proven 79% of people never finish those. Sure. And so usually when you get, if you can work with me, you get me. Mm -hmm. um, that way we're together for six to 12 weeks. And our session's about an hour long. Obviously, I'll budget some extra time if, if needed. But I, I love helping people reach their full potential, but tackling those pain points. And you don't tackle pain points if you don't listen well enough. Sure. Usually in that consultation, someone doesn't really know you that well. And so they may not be willing to drop their guard. Mm -hmm. uh, and the main thing is creating a comfortable space that they can let down the white picket fence, let them know if you're safe here. You be everything. I tell each client this, and some people try to may, may steal this, but it's copywritten by Jamal. <laughs> be everything you are and be everything you're not. I want to work with you. I don't want to work with your representative. Your representative is going to throw up a shield. Sure. Let it down. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get them to it. What's the most common thing clients struggle with when they, when they come to see you? I think the more so waiting for the moment of perfection when all the ducks are in a row. Okay. Like I said, my ideal client is a past version of myself. That's not going to happen for us thinkers. I'm telling you, you'll be waiting for an eternity. Sure. Um, and then also, it's weird. I know this will be a little different uh, probably for your audience, but unforgiveness and bitterness. It's am I'm amazed at how that locks people up and just keeps them, even from a career standpoint, from taking certain risk. It's something that they're holding on to that actually almost puts them in a quicksand of their own making. Okay. And so just with that, that's a huge one that a lot of them have some issues with parents. And I don't even know how that's a strange theme uh, with clients of mine. <laughs> how, uh, and it could be because of my own background. Sure. So when you're doing a, a six to 12 week program, at the end of 12 weeks, is there a way to measure success? Definitely. Well, one thing I do is do also a monthly check-in. Okay. Um, because, you know, you want to revisit like, it's okay, we're done six to 12 weeks. So what? Are there still things that are lingering? Are there some materials that, that need to be assigned to tackle certain things that came up in that last session as we offboard and transition? Mm -hmm. and, and a way to measure success is mainly through survey data. 
Okay, got it. Send it out. Potentially, this is a survey design from when you first come in. This is a survey from when you're out. And how do we measure those against one another? Brilliant. Good. So you are, in a sense, quantifying it. That's awesome. Yeah. When you interact with a client, at what point in that six to 12 week time period do you feel like the guard comes down and there, there's open dialogue, honest feedback, you and the client aren't sugarcoating anything? How long does it take for that to happen on average? On average, probably about a 30 session. And, and it all depends. I remember a, a young lady I worked with, it like by the second session, she <laughs> just like, boom, here it Wide is. Wide open. I mean, you know, she was, you know, I mean, had just amazing the potential that she has and, and, and the dreams she had and, and desire she had to go for something. But she was just dealing with a narcissistic parent mm. and she just laid it all out and just that disconnect um, between the two of them and, and just how how that locked her up into putting up so many different defenses and, and kind of never taking any risks. Because, you know, when you get when you have that fear of rejection, you always get shut down. Well, I take the risk. It's amazing. I, I tell my clients, I tell myself that it's true. The mind is a control tower to the body. Mm-hmm. And what you believe about life is going to affect the way you respond. Absolutely. I'm in and I'm out. So when you're applying the techniques or using this book as kind of the basis or the framework, right, for the, for the course, is the book a theme? And then are you literally leveraging your, your educational background and your experience as a counselor more than it is the practical applications of the book? Which one do you think is the lead? The lead is going to be, you know, my background and experience. Okay. And going to be mostly about what the, what the client gives me. What you, I can't really work with what you don't give me. Mm. And so creating that, that safe space, the book is just kind of fodder to get you to open up. Right. Because once you read, you know, you get into the chapter, you go probably a chapter, a session, that'll start opening up like, ooh. And then when, when I get your homework back from you, it's like, I'm going through the homework, checking off things for our next session. Like, okay, I noticed this. <laughs> I'm highlighting things, you know, and then it it opens us up from there. But like, to me, I don't I don't think it's wise to lead with material mm-hmm. uh, because you can kind of get so it can it makes it more heady and more intellectual. You never get to the heart of the matter. So a year ago when we talked, the podcast didn't exist. It was no. it was in its infancy. I don't think this business model existed at the time. You were kind of just finding your voice and you wanted to help people. Where does this go from here, Jamal? I mean, is this is this a business that you can scale? Do you want to scale it? I mean, what are your thoughts? I do. Right right now, I'm toying around with the idea of a specific like offer to put out there. Okay. Really, you know, built into a calendar calendar, um, and also scaling potentially to group counseling, group facilitation. Mm-hmm. I've been multiple people said, Jamal, why don't you? You love the one on one. You kill it there why don't you go into the, the group facilitation? Why don't you take it to corporate, you know, do a workshop? Mm-hmm. Um, those are ideas I'm bouncing around right now. Sure. Um, and so we'll see within the next three to six months, you know, what if that comes to fruition? But I would love at some point to, to do this full time and do it on a larger scale uh, because I love that. You know, I feel like when I'm counseling, coaching, mentoring, everything like that, I feel like I'm in my niche. I feel like I am in a state of flow. How do you compartmentalize it when you turn everything off at night and wind down and go do Jamal time? How are you able to process what you heard during the day? Because sometimes you're hearing things that are difficult, particularly in, in your past. How were you able to keep those from kind of bleeding over into your thoughts and your emotions? Uh, what's the best advice you can give people to try to figure out how to handle those kind of things? That's a really good question. And it also all depends on what it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think certain types of information we can turn off quicker than others. Sure. And certain things, especially if it's common and it hits home, you know, if a person's uh, part of their background or part of what they've dealt with triggers something in you, that's when it's good to go to take exercise and actually talk about it out loud. You know, I believe prayer and meditation is huge and your mind has to shut up to hear what your mouth has to say. So just kind of like, you know, that, that, I'm thinking about that right now. You know, being honest, a lot of people aren't, even professional counselors, and hear me, some of you guys may want to counsel me or unfollow me. A lot of us are not honest with ourselves or gut level honest. It's okay to talk about what bothers you. It's okay to get in the mirror and talk to yourself in the morning and say, you know what, did that shock me? Did that bother me? Did that trigger something in me? (laughs) 
and be real about it, which is one reason why you see me in so many videos outside a lot, getting out in nature and taking time to just get still and back away from social media. Uh, I think that's what helps me turning off all the noise mm-hmm. when there's Jamal time. And, and then knowing that that is the session that's part of, of what we're doing, but now I need time to process my own thoughts so that I'm in a healthy headspace to deal with them in a way that's redemptive. So being intentional about that is, is huge. You know, it's interesting when I see your video content, that is almost what you project unintentionally. But I see you when you turn the camera on, you're walking and it's out in nature. And I actually saw somebody comment about the fact that they really enjoy those videos because you're, you're out in nature. But it's almost like your facial expression and your tone, it, it oozes, hey, I've actually just kind of processed some stuff. I feel good. I feel energized. And let me share with you what I've just processed. It feels really organic. I'm sure there's some thought, but it feels very organic, which is one of the reasons I think, and we talked about this before we turned record on, you didn't set out to capture 25,000 plus followers, but you have them and you haven't played the game. You've just been you. And that's one of the reasons we're talking. And I asked you to be on the show is if you'd have compared our conversation a year ago to today, it's the same person. You've just found your vehicle. And I think it's awesome. I appreciate the encouragement, Pete. You're, you're too kind, man. But I think going back to what you were saying is from the standpoint of doing it, it comes on the heels of prayer and meditation. Mm-hmm. And so I am a bit more centered, you know, yeah. when I do these videos, but it's not this, this is how you provide value, do these five things. I don't talk to people B2B. No. Um, and I don't tell them what to do. You have a lot of content, especially on LinkedIn, even on Instagram. Um, that are telling people what to do, offer suggestions and let people put their nuances on that thing. I have a video, it's, it's probably my video vault. I have like probably 70 videos that I haven't even released yet. And what are you about? Six, two, six, one? Six, one. And, and when I'm standing next to my kids and my toes, I try to get up to six, two. They're, <laughs> they're all taller than me. <laughs> so normally when I'm eating, right, I'm a 32 inch waist. I would bet my pants fit different on me than they fit on you, even if you're a 32, 31, or 34, because you're a different person. Yes. A lot of content on the platform and on different platforms acts like we all wear the same size. Mm-hmm. And if you do your content that way, you're going to miss a large audience. Offer suggestions and then give person room based on their frame of reference and their background to make application. Sure. It's more applicable when it's like, okay, I have room. I can apply that to my situation. I can apply that even to myself culturally, mm-hmm. you know, because you got to think the majority of people that follow my content don't look like me. I didn't set out with that intention. No. Yeah. You know, I'm not, a. I can honestly say like, love you. I'm not a part of black LinkedIn. I'm, I'm just out here. Yeah. Who, he who has an ear, let him hear. You're just Jamal. That's it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things I enjoyed about our conversation. Because when we talked a year ago, pretty difficult period of time in the country. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> and, you put me at ease in three minutes in the conversation by, to your point, just talking. You said, let's talk about it. And whatever the topic is, I think that you have a gift of helping people. And, I, and when I read a lot of your, by the way, not a lot of people have as many recommendations as you do. So well done people. And the people wrote a lot. I mean, it wasn't like, oh, Jamal's a good guy. I love his videos. Like people went into detail about what they like. And the theme was pretty constant that, Every one of them felt like that when they were talking with you, you made them feel comfortable instantly, which breaks down barriers. It allows people to be more open and trusting. And for a lot of other people, it takes time to build trust. But I think you, uh, you have a gift of doing that a little more quickly, which, by the way, to your, you probably have to have your guard up a little bit because you, know, you got to be somewhat cautious about who gets into that circle and takes advantage of that trust. So yeah, there's, I'm sure there's some stories about that for a separate episode, but When you say prayer and meditation, give the people that are listening here, what does your schedule look like on a daily basis? What do you do every day that gets you centered? How do you partition your time and how do you stay focused? Okay, so here in this neighborhood, I'm in uh, the D.C. area. Mm -hmm. There are four Civil War forts. Okay. Uh, And so it'd be nice to to drive to them. I, I like to go ahead and walk to them. It's about four miles from where I stay at. Okay. I'm in a pretty busy city block. 
And so once I get inside the Civil War fort, it's just quiet. And so I take that time and each one of them is about three miles long just to get there, just to one, talk to, to God about my day, mm -hmm. uh, one, to pray for others, but starting with gratitude. And I think it's easy, especially if you think about, if you look on the news today, it's easy to talk about what we don't have or what's being taken away from us yep. or what we feel like from a, I don't want to use that, that C word from a vaccination standpoint, mm -hmm. where we feel like we're being taken, <laughs> wherever you fall on the rung of that. Um, mm -hmm. But I have so much to be thankful for. So giving thanks first, expressing gratitude. And, and sometimes even if I have to take out a list and going through a journal. Yep. And then lifting up, you know, I work for an anti-human trafficking agency. There's always need. So there's a lot of need to lift up. There's mm -hmm. things going on in my family. I have a life outside of the platform. So lifting up the needs of others and then just talking to God. Like I, like I would talk to a person. I mean, honoring what I see and what I believe God to be, but also having a conversation. Not being religious, not speaking Elizabethan English, not using a scripture every five yep. lines, but just having a conversation. And it's usually during those times, you know, uh, when I'm getting exercise, when I'm getting the heart rate up, where concepts will come. And then, you know, once I've been about an hour in, maybe like, why don't you take out your camera and just kind of <laughs> share some of those thoughts? It was just so strange how that happens. It works for you. And I, I think there's a great message and tip there. I have See, my prayer life evolved as well into much more of a conversation, it, usually covering those same three topics, by the way. So that's interesting. But you're right. I, and it doesn't have to be perfect. There's often times where I go, oh, wait, one more thing. You know, <laughs> and I kind of laugh at myself like, yeah, I forgot to, to thank you for this or I forgot to ask about this or this one person is going through these things. And, and I think that's how it's supposed to be. I think it's supposed to be a conversation, you know, even, and it's not one way. I mean, I think it's great that you get those sessions processed. And then that's when you kind of open up your camera and say, here's where I'm at. And I'm, and I'm, I'm there, man, I'm in the zone. And I'll be honest with your, your audience about nearly four years ago, like right after my, my dad uh, passed part of uh, what started these, these long walks was I, I would be on these walks for hours because I wasn't um, for a year. I didn't work I'm actually going to be doing some content about that. I would just volunteer and do different things. And, because I was turning down jobs that, that mm -hmm. weren't in the area. And I didn't know really how to talk to God at first because I was very angry. So I would walk around by myself on this local tennis court. Part of this neighborhood is like, I call it, part of it is the Will Smith part, part of it is Carlton Banks part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> super rich, see, super rich. But like no one would be on this tennis court. And so I would just drop a lot of F-bombs. I didn't know what to say. Sure. That's all that would come out. So that, that was my prayer life. I call it from profanity to, to prayer. And then I realized after looking around that it was a bunch of these civil war forts and people were probably walking by, like looking at some dude just running around on a tennis court, dropping F-bombs, like it's crazy. So I was like, let me just go do this where I'm not seen as much. <laughs> so that ended up, that is how my prayer life actually started. And it, I don't drop F-bombs anymore. Uh, <laughs> but that is, I began to start actually talking to God. I was just, I started from frustration. I didn't know what to say. And those ended up being conversations, but it kept me, I'll say this, it kept me real. It kept me raw. And I haven't lost that, that cathartic communication uh, with a higher being. So I'm thankful for that. Well, you know, I think it's a fitting way to, to end. I, I think just a very interesting episode where you've given everybody a, a way to think of how they can bring that into their lives, right? In, in whatever spirituality you want to focus on, having that ability to get outside yourself, and be thankful, pray for others. It helps you center what you're going through mm -hmm. a lot better and process the things that are in front of you. And I think it'll be interesting to watch you in the next year to see how this platform comes along. I think you're on a, a really organic mission. This isn't a, a LinkedIn mission. This is your mission. Link just, just happens to be one of your platforms. That's a good way to put it, Pete. <laughs> well, buddy, I'm grateful that you were able to take some time today and he was on nonstop calls and he had to eat as we were prepping just to get some energy back in before we did this call. So I'm grateful you, you gutted it out, man. It's awesome. Thanks for having me, bro. Anytime, man. Oh, Jamal, it's been great having you on Eating Crow. I'll put uh, some links to uh, Jamal's content in the show notes and uh, you can reach him there as well. But just deep, thoughtful, and enjoyable, Jamal. I appreciate it. Same here, man. God All bless. right, buddy. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> 
Thanks for checking out Eating Crow. Like and subscribe so you never miss a video.